Well, welcome to this Bible study. This is the first in our series looking at the book of Nehemiah. We're going to take this one chapter at a time. We're not going to read through all of the verses of the entire chapter, but what we're going to do is take a sample of verses and we're going to discuss the main themes that come out in those verses and the chapter as a whole. And we really pray that this blesses you. And uh, we're going to cover Nehemiah chapter one today. Let's go ahead and read the verses. This is Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And it says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And so we're going to have a look and hopefully uh, shed some light on the context of um, this book, especially in this first video. We're going to look at these verses and hopefully just give a general introduction to the book of Nehemiah as well. And uh, Dr. John, it makes sense to start at the beginning. Um, first off, who's the author of this book? Right. Um, scholars generally accept that Nehemiah wrote the book. Um, it's a very interesting book, really. I mean, it's actually complemented by the book of Ezra. And those two books originally in the Hebrew text were one book and they're only separated out many centuries later when it was translated into Latin. Mm. And it's interesting if you look at the, the book of Nehemiah, it's divided into kind of two sections. First seven chapters generally kind of political, looked about the preparations for the building, the actual reconstruction of the walls, mm. city walls of Jerusalem. And the last six chapters are generally more spiritual. They're mm. looking at the, the renewal of the people mm. turning to God again in obedience um, uh, to the, the covenant, the original agreement, a covenant that God had made with his people. Mm. And to quote the, the scholar uh, Nelson, it's construction followed by instruction. Mm. Um, the book covers periods about 19 years from 444 to 425 BC. And it was written after the Jewish people returned from captivity in, in Babylon. Mm. And the book was written around about 425 BC during King Artaxerxes' reign. And Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. Mm. Now you think, you know, cupbearer, you know, just coming along with a cup of wine or whatever, <laughs> but it was a lot more than that. Again, mm. quoting from theologian Nelson, it was a very responsible position mm. uh, and involved being a personal advisor to the king. Mm. Uh, the king later made Nehemiah a governor of Judah. And the word uh, in the Hebrew actually means the Lord comforts. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, Nehemiah led a group of people from their exile in, in Babylon to Jerusalem. And their aim there to rebuild the city walls and establish the, the civil authority in the city. Mm. And he came 14 years after Ezra had arrived from mm. exile. Mm. Uh, also Malachi, prophet Malachi, um, wrote, prophesied and wrote about the issues uh, about this time, uh, about the people, the remnant in Judah. Mm. Um, Nehemiah experienced considerable fierce opposition, mm. because we're mm. looking at that why that opposition, to the wall in his building project. But nevertheless, the, nevertheless, God was with him, and that wall was completed in really kind of record mm. time, mm. Yeah. Uh, in, in 52 days. So it's a fascinating book, really, yeah. looking at how God has uh, strengthened and helped his people. Mm. Brilliant. That's a really helpful introduction, Dr. John, and I love that. First seven chapters are all about the reconstruction of the wall and the latter six chapters all about the instruction of the people and uh pastor fraser i suppose that with it being an old testament book mm -hmm. um something that's so helpful to get give us a grasp of this book as a whole is understanding uh, a bit of where the narrative sits within uh, the bible as a whole mm -hmm. so would you just be able to shed a little bit of light on that yeah so this is an old testament history i guess is kind of the um would be the type of book that this is it, it, it's a 
documentary, I guess, material. Um, and as Dr. John said, like Nehemiah is a strong, commanding, decisive, godly leader. The book's a compelling narrative with him as a, really as the hero of it. But the mm. documentary material is constantly interrupted with the flow of the narrative. And there's a historical impulse from the author as well. There's reports. And it's just it's a really powerful book. Mm. And it sits in terms of the, the whole Bible about a thousand years after Moses mm -hmm. and about 400 years before Jesus. Right. The people of God are in a terrible state. As Dr. John said, the nation of God's people has been destroyed. First of all, the northern kingdom of Israel has been conquered, and then the southern kingdom of Judah. Mm. Babylon had conquered them. They'd laid waste to Jerusalem. The temple's mm. been destroyed. The walls have been destroyed. You know, the mm. once glorious temple of Solomon has been obliterated. Mm. And the Babylonians have captured many of the people of God, left Jerusalem, and, and left Jerusalem as somewhat of, of a ghost town, really. Mm. And then many of the Jews, they settled in Babylon, and there's prominent examples of faithful people here. You know, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, Queen Esther in the Persian courts. And then 70 years into captivity, you know, they're given the opportunity to return. Babylon's taken over by uh, Persia and um, Zerubbabel and Ezra kind of go back, like Dr. John was saying. And then, you know, just after that, uh, Nehemiah comes yeah. back and starts mm -hmm. to... So Ezra mm -hmm. um, and Zerubbabel, they, they rebuild the temple and then Nehemiah comes back to rebuild the walls. So I think that's where it kind of sits. Brilliant. That's really helpful. So it sits right almost at the end of the Old Testament history. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were to plot the kind of timeline of the Old Testament, it's interesting, isn't it? Although Nehemiah is kind of almost in the middle of the Old Testament mm. in terms of the timeline, it's right at the end mm. of the Old Testament. And as you said, just kind of just after Ezra, around the s similar time of Esther and similar time of some of the prophets as well. Mm -hmm. um, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Okay. Um, Okay, and so um, for people listening, obviously Old Testament, there's a lot of names being thrown around, Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. Esther, um, all this kind of stuff. I mean, um, Amy, would you be able to just shed a little bit of uh, uh, light and just talk a little bit more about that kind of period? How did we get to where Nehemiah mm -hmm. picks up? Mm, absolutely. So um, as Fraser has just mentioned, you know, we've got Babylonia who take over uh, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And then about... Uh, you know, a little bit of time after that, then you've got uh, Persia who come in, swoop in. Mm -hmm. And um, it's around that time as well when we see King Cyrus, who is mm -hmm. the Persian king, right. and he sort of releases Zerubbabel and Jeshua to go back. Mm -hmm. You know, these are, you know, brilliant people and they go back and they start to rebuild the temple. And then a little bit of time after that, we see Ezra go back. Mm -hmm. And Ezra, you know, he is, um, you know, a teacher. He's there to teach the Torah. Mm -hmm. um, and then about 30, 14 years after that that's when we see um nehemiah come back and he's as we've mentioned you know he's the cupbearer really prestigious mm. uh, position as well so we've got various different people um you know people who are who've actually come from the exile yep. um which is really important to note as well mm, that's really helpful and that's going to come in later on isn't it laulu anything to add to what we've spoken about there in terms of the context of this book you know there's these words being thrown around exile jewish remnant you know just any further comments on those at all yeah, I mean, I guess everyone has kind of touched on it already, but I guess to clarify, um, I guess even further, and I, you know, looking at, as you said, the two words, one being exile and the other being the Jewish remnant. And so when uh, the people um, of Israel, you know, when they were taken um, into captivity, actually, when they were, when, it, when, um, Jerusalem was conquered um, mm -hmm. actually the people were then exiled and actually they were then in captivity for 70 years mm -hmm. uh, and in that time actually even though some were exiled some of them um, some of the people in Jerusalem were able to then stay back again not a lot just a, mm -hmm. a very small, small minority mm -hmm. uh, but the people who were able to stay back for that short period of time were the Jewish remnant the people mm -hmm. who were there again it was kind of as you say like a ghost town um, in, in Jerusalem, like it was something that, you know, it, it could have been forgotten at that time because so many people were taken into, cap um, into captivity. Mm. Uh, but then, yeah, there were um, a few who um, and, and ended up staying there who were then the Jewish remnants. But uh, yeah, no, it's really interesting looking at, um, yeah, just how, you know, how much goes into this and actually, mm. you know, how, um, yeah, we see, I mean, we see, um, you know, the, the likes of, um, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah, um, you know, come into it. But yeah, I just, I just find it really um, fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's really, really helpful. And so, you know, after, 
after the exile, obviously, you know, it, you can read about that in Two Kings. Mm -hmm. There's the Assyrians come in and the Babylonians come in. They take out all the people. They just leave the poorest of the poor there. And then as, uh, as the guys have said, there's a couple of waves spoken about in the book of Ezra of people returning. And uh, they've started to build the temple. They've um, started to reform the people a little bit, but there's clearly work to do. And so, um, and this is where we get to with Nehemiah. And it is a fascinating book, mm. um, Dr. John. I know that um, a couple of people have commented on themes that come up in this book already. Nehemiah, he's a fearless leader. Um, there's a sense of rebuilding and reforming that comes through during this book. But what key themes should a reader expect to come across when covering the book of Nehemiah? Um, the theme is basically God is helping the Jewish people to rebuild the walls. But there is, there is opposition, fierce opposition, um, from people like Sambalat and Tobiah. Now, Sambalat was a Horonite, uh, Tobiah was an Ammonite. Now you kind of think, what on earth are those? Yeah. But these were the nations which historically mm. had opposed uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the, the, um, under Joshua, the Israelites went into the Promised Land and they defeated the nations there, um, those are some of the nations that were opposing the people mm. of God. Mm. And now it's the kind of coming back again to cause problems. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also uh, Geshem in Arabic again. Uh, they, they were coming, they were pouring ridicule and scorn. It was interesting because uh, there's a reading, it says, as the walls got taller, the Sambalat and his comrades got angrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was the insults as well. So mm. there's this theme of the, the, the opposing them, but they're trying to ridicule. Mm. Yeah. And I think today, you know, people can ridicule the work of the people mm. of God, mm. can, can make fun of that. And they were doing the same thing there. Mm. Um, the, the other kind of themes there are towards the end where Ezra is reading the book of the law of God. Mm. And there's this kind of restitution, this uh, coming back to God, the people are really reflecting on the past, how God had blessed that nation in the past, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but how their nation had turned away, repeatedly mm -hmm. turned away from God, uh, gone to false gods, disobeyed mm -hmm. God, and there was this kind of uh, repentance, turning mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kind of renewing that, that covenant, yeah. uh, and making a kind of pledge, making an agreement mm -hmm. to serve the, mm -hmm. the living God. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant, Dr. John. Uh, Pastor Fraser, just anything to add to that on the kind of themes that we can expect to come across? Yeah, I mean, I think um, three kind of key messages that I've found through the book is that God will use secular means to accomplish sacred purposes. Mm. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, this wasn't like a godly king that, right. sent, that sends Nehemiah back, mm. right? It's not a godly king, yep. but actually God works through him. God yeah. can use secular means to accomplish mm. sacred purposes. Um, and then sometimes we have to, I guess, like Dr. John was um, alluding to there with the um, persecution that was happening towards the people of God as they were building. Sometimes we have to mm. battle and build at the same time. Mm. I think that's a key theme that we see right. um, throughout the book. And then Dr. John's kind of said it, but to say it in a different way, God is faithful to preserve his promises in the midst of persecution. Like there's mm. persecution come in, but if we trust God, and, and that's one of the great things about Nehemiah is constantly, mm. I mean, even in these first four verses, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept mm. and then I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. Like mm. he's constantly, he's a man of God and he, he's constantly going to God. And we see that God is faithful to preserve his promises in the midst mm. of, of persecution. That's brilliant. And we're going to obviously meet these characters mm. and mm. these, events as we read through the book we're going to take this over the next number of weeks but that sense of preserving the the promise that's um that's a really fascinating one isn't it because i think it positions nehemiah as such a helpful book to get a grasp mm -hmm. of in the bible sweep as a whole because you see it as a book which has been pointed to by other books and other uh, prophetic books for example jeremiah and Absolutely. others um but then you also see it as almost a a hint of a link between um the old testament and the new because mm -hmm. you think by the time jesus comes onto the scene there are jews all over jerusalem jerusalem is rebuilt mm -hmm. it's a very different picture to the you know torn down and burnt jerusalem that is left after the exile when nehemiah almost points towards the direction that is going to mm. unfold before jesus comes on the scene there um 
So just covering these verses again, just looking back at these, the words of Nehemiah, mm-hmm. son of Hakali, we've covered that, the author is Nehemiah. And so one of his brothers comes from Judah and uh, Nehemiah asks him about the Jewish remnant. Mm-hmm. And they said, those who survived the exile are back with me in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned by fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned, fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Amy, like this is a a picture of a passionate man, isn't it? Yes. What can we learn about the character of Nehemiah from his response? Absolutely. I mean, to some, it may appear like a bit of an extreme response. You know, he's mourned and wept for days. He even had Mm. to sit down. You know, he couldn't stand, you know, Mm. receiving this news. Um, Mm. He prayed and fasted. And it wasn't just that he was a little sad. It was that he was distraught. Right. And I think actually it's really important to note here that actually sometimes when God wants to do something great, he has to do a great work in somebody. Mm. And actually he really wanted to use Nehemiah and actually kind of had to feel that burden in order to be moved to do something about it. And Mm. I mean, even if we look at the sort of historical significance of the wall, I Mm. think that can be linked to the historical prominence of Jerusalem. You know, it was, Mm. you know, that's full of God's people, you know, it was a fortress, a stronghold, you know, but then after the Babylonian exile, it was reduced to a pile of rubbish and a, mm. a pile of rubble. And that almost just kind of represents where the nation was at. And actually, mm. you know, Nehemiah felt that. And in order mm. to be able to be stirred to do something, he had to mm. feel the weight of that first. I love that. So it almost, it's pointing towards the the impact that that news had on Nehemiah inside mm. himself before we then see the actions he took. And Laulu, it's so fascinating to see that Nehemiah in his response what does he do? He prays. Mm, yeah. And so what, what, could, what lessons could we learn today from, from Nehemiah responding in that way? Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, it shows that, you know, prayer for Nehemiah wasn't like a second thing. You know, in like, he didn't like think about it for 10 years and then come back and then mm-hmm. think, oh, yeah, it's time to pray about it. Actually, he went to God straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this really shows that Nehemiah was a man for God's heart. And we, we really see this, you know, even going through the entire book mm-hmm. of Nehemiah, whenever he encounters any bit of trouble, literally straight away, he prays about it. He encourages mm-hmm. the people around him to pray. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think I'm um, even, again, speaking about the themes of the book, I think, a really good theme that does come through through Nehemiah is leadership mm. through prayer. Mm. Um, like I said, encouraging the people to um, not look at um, you know what other men and women think, but actually to you know to look at um, you know what you know what God thinks. And I mm. think actually this is a um, yeah looking at us practically today, I think it really shows, as I said, Nehemiah, he was a man for God's heart. He was a man, I mean, back in the, uh, you know, Old Testament days, he fully, you know, followed like all, like the laws and he was like a very studious man as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he um, really took it seriously. And I, I think it's something that, um, yeah, we, we, we can all learn today as well. Brilliant. That's fascinating as well. Cause I think just from what Laulu's saying as well, like it's, you know, his first response was prayer. Like it would mm. be easy for him, you know, he's sat in a palace. He's yeah. got an unbelievable job, a great career. Mm-hmm. Like his life's kind of made. They've no. been in exile for for, for, for decades now. No. It would be so easy to think of this as just some faraway land right. that just doesn't really matter, right? It could have been mm. so easy for him to think that, but actually because it mattered to God, because it was God's people, mm. it was God's city, and you know, the walls being down, that meant the city was prone to attacks. It means that God's people were being taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. It, this broke Nehemiah's heart. And yep. I love what Lalu was saying, like what breaks God's heart broke Nehemiah's mm. heart. Like actually he had a burden for this. And mm. I think it's incredible that Nehemiah had that burden because it would be mm. so almost easy for him to just enjoy being in the palace, enjoy the yeah, nice yeah. food. And, you know, I know we'll get onto it probably later, but it was, yeah. you know, it was dangerous for him to come to the king with this. Yeah, yeah very true. Did. So, yeah. Powerful. Very true. Uh, there, there's definitely a theme of uh, of selflessness almost mm. that comes mm. through with Nehemiah. As you say, he's in this palace, um, but and yet he's not looking just to his own needs. He looks throughout the book to the needs of others, right. to the things that God cares mm. about. You know, this is Jerusalem, yes. this is God's city. Um, and so if it matters to God, it matters yeah. to him. Uh, I, I really love that. Any, uh, any, Dr. John, um, any final comments on encouragement to people reading the book of Nehemiah? What, um, what words of advice or guidance would you give? I think looking at the example of Nehemiah, that he carried on, he didn't give up. There was real fierce opposition mm. But he encouraged his people. He had a, a goal in sight because 
The, mm. the problem with the ruins there were um, there was constant, highly visible reminder of the defeat by a pagan mm. army. So mm. when, wherever they looked, there's these walls that they all crumbled down. Mm. Um, and yet the, the walls were, when they rebuilt, were a symbol mm. of strength for the city. Right. Mm. Uh, and he had that love for the, for the people mm. of, the, of the city. So despite all the opposition, despite... Uh, and they, you know, they, were to, they were building another sword in the hand. Mm. They were, it wasn't just the insults. There was a threat to their lives. Mm. Mm. Uh, and they, they carried on. They didn't give up mm. um, despite that. And, and God was with them. Mm. And they achieved that goal with the strength of God. Mm. So yeah, the message is... Uh, Never, ever, ever, ever give up. Come on, brilliant. Carry on. Amen. Brilliant. Never, ever give up. What a brilliant note uh, to finish up on. As we read this book, Nehemiah, we're going to learn about the people of God, but in, in a way, just as much, we're going to learn a whole lot about the character of Nehemiah and what an inspirational character he is. Thank you for joining us. 